morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, so my name is Sonia Lessa, I'm from McGill University, um, and I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to the second of our special webinar series on the impact of the pandemic on women and girls in developing countries. This series aims to engage researchers, policymakers, and practitioners on matters around women's empowerment and the impacts that the pandemic and its associated economic crisis has on women in the global south. So today's topic is universally familiar to all of us who have young children during these pandemic times. With schools and daycares closed around the world, how do we balance increased care needs and responsibilities with our need to provide a livelihood for our families? And this especially at a time when we're facing a historic economic crisis. As we will hear from today's panelists, balancing work and care has always been tenuous, especially for women and especially in low and middle income settings. Now we know from a significant body of research um, that women's disproportionate burden of care has been a key determinant of many gender gaps, uh, not least of which the labor market gap. The pandemic has not only highlighted existing inequalities in who bears the responsibility of care for children, the disabled, the ill and the elderly. Indeed, we read story after story of how the traditional gender norms around care, especially in, the, um, uh, in, in care especially, are in fact being reinforced. And this is partly as a result, as we have seen from our first webinar, uh, due to the fact that women have suffered disproportionately from job losses during this crisis. So today what we're going to do is we're going to unpack the nexus between women's care and work. And how are we going to do this? We're going to dive into the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on the care economy. So we're going to hear from the worlds of research, practice, civil society, and policy decision-making on these very issues. And our panelists will share with us their reflections to highlight some of the research priorities and also to identify some possible policy solutions. So the Women's Empowerment in Development Lab at McGill University is immensely grateful for the generous support from Canada's International Development Research Center, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, and also its partnership with McGill's Institute for the Study of International Development. While we are meeting virtually, the series and the lab are hosted by McGill University, which is located on land that has long served as the site in, of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg nations. McGill honors, recognizes, and respects these nations as the traditional stewards of lands and waters on which we virtually meet today. So before introducing our panel, I'd like to introduce our team, Lavar Buhani, Professor Franck Grimard, and also Martha Miles from IDRC. And I would like to now uh, invite Martha to say a few words uh, on behalf of IDRC. Thank you, thank you, Sonia. And let me add my warm welcome uh, to everyone who's joined us. So morning, afternoon, evening. Um, my name is Martha Miles, and I lead IDRC's uh, Employment and Growth Program, which houses the Growth and Economic Opportunities for Women Initiative, or GROW in short. GROW is a five-year action research program jointly funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation at IDRC. Our aim is to find uh, scalable solutions for adv advancing gender equality in the world of work with a focus on East Africa. Uh, in particular, the program focuses on three areas, addressing gender segregation of employment, reducing and redistributing unpaid care work and unleashing women's collective aid. As Sonia mentioned, this is a second in a series of webinars that we launched a couple of weeks ago in partnership with the lab and more to come, so stay tuned. What we hope to do through the series is to spur discussion on how COVID-19 is impacting women's lives and livelihoods in low and middle income countries why gender matters in COVID response and economic re rebuilding, and what opportunities uh, we see in building back better. So as we know, the pandemic has magnified both the magnitude and significance of unpaid care work women perform the world over, and its impact on their own um, economic uh, prospects and that of their families. And it has also increased the demand for care, as Sonia just mentioned. And we know from previous pandemics that as their care duties increase, women, many women find it difficult to transition back into paid jobs. 
So reducing and redistributing women's unpaid care burden um, needs to be at the core of the mitigation and rebuilding processes as countries put together policies and intervention um, post COVID-19 and during. The GROW uh, program will play an important role in supporting scalable solutions to address these in context of East Africa. And I look forward to hearing from our panelists today and how the, this is playing out in different country contexts, but what opportunities they also see in building back better. And I look forward to uh, the discussion that ensues as well. So without further ado, I turn it back to you, Sonia. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, um, Martha. Uh, I'd like to now introduce the um, panel. Um, first of all, I would like to um, just remind everybody that we will have um, each panelist go in turn and talk to us for about 10 minutes. After that, we will have a round table conversation where we're going to um, identify both research priorities and also possible policy solutions. And then after that, we will open it up to questions and answers. Um, so our first panelist today is Patricia Kitsao Wekulo who is an Associate Research Scientist at the African Population and Health Research Center in Nairobi, Kenya, where she has also received her postdoctoral training. She has a strong interest in child development research, and she has been involved in, um, uh, in this particular area for more than 10 years. Her current work focuses on interventions to strengthen the capacity of caregivers to provide holistic nurturing care to their young children. So Patricia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sonia. Um, so as we look at uh, what's happening in terms of women's economic empowerment um, in the times of COVID, I just want to present a brief overview of the problem. And uh, Leva has already spoken about um, some of the things that we're seeing with regards to women. Um, the research shows us that women spend three times as much as men on unpaid care work. And uh, this pre prevents them from getting into remaining and progressing in the labor force. Now, this results in a lack of women's participation in critical sectors of the economy, because most of the engagement that uh, women, most of the sectors that women are engaged in are in the informal economy. So in the very important sectors of the economy, we have very little women's participation. Um, if we look at some statistics, we see that um, as of 2018, 2.1 billion people were in need of care. And out of this, 1.9 billion were young children and about 200 million were older persons. If we look at the time that uh, is spent on unpaid care work, it is equivalent to 2 billion people working for eight hours a day without any pay. When you look at the women who are unable to work, the statistics show us that there are about um, 600 million. And if we're thinking about the time it will take to close the gender gap, that's about 210 years. Now, if there are changes made with women are um, participating in the, econ in the economy, it's going to result in changes across four FDG, F SGDs, sorry. That's the health, SDG three on health, SDG 4 on education, SDG 5 on gender equality, and SDG 8 on um, decent work and economic growth. Now, I just want to talk a bit about what is currently happening, what we are seeing. And this is based on work, ongoing work that has been done by different organizations, as well as what we are seeing happening um, from, the, from our observations. Now, when we look at... Um, in formal settlement settings, there's uh, ongoing work that's being carried out by Population Council. And this work is within five informal settlements in Nairobi. They've done some interviews. They're doing uh, weekly interviews with um, participants in those settlements just to find out their experience of COVID. And as you can see from the graph on the left, women are being impacted more there's a greater loss of income among women. There's increased cleaning um, responsibilities for women as a result of COVID. 
increased child care responsibilities. A higher proportion of women is reporting that they've skipped meals because of COVID. And then um, there are also issues to do with the gen gender-based violence, which women are experiencing more of compared to men. Now, when you look at the health worker, health, health sector, most of the health workers in that sector are, are female. And these ones right now are facing a double care giving burden because whereas at work, they're expected to work for longer hours and they have more responsibilities. When they get back home, they also have a caregiving burden. So on both sides, both at work and at home, these women are facing a greater burden. Um, recently, the Director General of Health in Kenya um, suggested that um, uh, care for COVID-19 patients should move to home-based care. And who is going to take care of these people when they're at home? It's the women. Now, the aim of the home-based care is to decongest health facilities because they don't want them to get overwhelmed. We are seeing increasing cases of uh, COVID-19 in um, Kenya. And the, report, the reports are that most of these cases are asymptomatic. Now, the thinking is that there is no sense in having these uh, asymptomatic patients in health facilities. So the, the suggestion is for them to be taken care of in home-based isolation facilities. Right now, um, as of yesterday, 25% of the COVID-19 patients in Kenya, only 25% were being taken care of in health facilities. 75% are being directed to isolation facilities either at home or in other places. Um, our work within the informal settlements, APHRC work, we worked within uh, Korogocho, within, among women who needed uh, childcare facilities. And the results at that time showed us that 35% of the sample that we were working with are involved in low prestige jobs, such as cleaning, nanny, taking care of young children, and laundry jobs. Now, many of these jobs have been, have been lost because of the economic impact of COVID. And the other result of the COVID is that many households do not want what they call day scholars. These are the helps who um, go to the homes on a daily basis. So in the evenings when they return to their, when they, when they are finished with their work, they return to their homes. Most households do not want people coming in and going out of their houses because they feel that these people are exposing them to a greater risk of uh, contracting COVID. So the, the people who are relying on these jobs have lost them because of this situation that we find ourselves in. Now, if you look at the picture at the bottom left, the, the, what, what COVID has, uh, what has, what has happened as a result of COVID is that we're seeing reverse migration. People are now moving from urban areas to rural areas. Most of these people who are moving are women because they are the ones who feel that they are less, less able to survive in this situation. And they are being forced by the current circumstances to move, to, to move back to their rural areas. Um, what can be done? There are several things that can be done. We need uh, targeted access for in, or to information on COVID-19 for women. We need uh, grants to women to cover the loss of income that they've experienced as a result of COVID. Um, like I spoke about the past work that APHRC has done in Korogocho, where we were able to provide um, quality to the informal daycare centers that um, are run in those areas. We need to do more research on the direct and indirect um, effects of COVID, particularly within the childcare sector and on women's care work, because we are seeing a lot of anecdotal evidence um, suggesting that women have suffered more, even in terms of um, availability of childcare services. Then the other thing that can be done, we need to support working parents with safe and appropriate childcare options. We have a project that is ongoing within the APHRC that is looking at the feasibility and acceptability of setting up childcare services within um, workplaces. Now, many of these women in informal settlements work in um, casual jobs. They are daily wage workers. And if the industries that employ them can be encouraged to set up centers where these children are kept, are looked after, 
it will open up more opportunities for these women to look for and remain in um, more, high, more highly paid jobs. And where we want to be at the end of all this, we want to see social protection measures in place for women. And as a result of having these measures, we're going to see less, these women experiencing less violence. One of the things we're going to see is that they'll experience less violence. We're going to see the um, economic profile of these women being improved. We are going to see um, more access to, for example, education facilities and health services if we have these um, protection measures in place. We want to be in a place where there is meaningful involvement of women, particularly related to COVID-19 responses. There's a lot of decisions being made about how we should respond to what we are seeing as a result of COVID. And if you look at, um, even on the social media, if you look at the panels that are being constituted, if you look at the meetings that are being um, held to discuss what can be done in response to COVID, many of the people participate, participating in these meetings and forums are men. We need a change so that more women are participating in these forums. We need also to get to a place where there's a reduction and redistribution of unpaid care work. One of the ways that this can happen is um, if we have a change in social norms. Right now, everybody, traditionally, the work of, for example, taking care of young children is left to women. And there are very few men who participate in, um, who take childcare responsibilities. We need to see a change in that so that there's equal distribution in the unpaid care, care work that women are increasingly burdened with. And then we want to see um, decent work for care workers. We want to be in a place where they feel that their dignity, their dignity is being maintained and they are, their chances for growth in their work or in their professional development are equal, similar to what um, men have. So we want to see a place where gender equity is being achieved in all sectors of the economy. Um, the bottom line, we have gender inequities right now. These ones, when there's an outbreak, they're magnified. And um, if we have responses that do not incorporate gender analysis, the inequities are going to be exacerbated. And I hope that um, this webinar is the beginning of conversations on how women's um, involvement in the work, in work and um, other sectors of the economy is going to be improved. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Patricia. Um, I'll uh, now move next to our second panelist, uh, Shaminaz Polin. Shaminaz Polin is currently working with Oxfam Canada and International Program uh, Department for Women's Economic Empowerment and Transformative Leadership Union Unit. Uh, Poland has been managing a portfolio of projects in Bangladesh, Indonesia, South Sudan, focused on domestic workers' rights, women's economic empowerment, strengthening women's leadership in village budgeting, and food security. Poland has an MA in environmental science and management. And now, uh, Poland, I will um, uh, leave you the floor. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, much, um, uh, the, the much talked about topic is a uh, care economy in the global south and um, and how it has amplified um, uh, with this COVID-19 outbreak. So uh, there was a there was a queer crisis before COVID-19 due to inequality, and we all know it. Uh, this uh, pandemic has worsened uh, that situation. Uh, before COVID-19, heavy and unequal care responsibilities were already trapping women in time and income poverty and locking them out of public and political life. Uh, with women providing 12.5 billion hours of unpaid care work per day, 
three times more than men, as just Patricia also mentioned. Oxfam's uh, time to care report calculated that women's unpaid care work alone is adding value to the economy to the tune of at least 10.8 trillion a year, a figure that is three times larger than the tech industry itself. Um, and, and also to think that this is an underestimated uh, value because, of course, we don't put enough emphasis on uh, data uh, collection in this, in this sector to begin with. This is not new. Oxfam Canada has placed a significant effort into analysis of what a feminist approach to we is and can be and what progressive donors uh, can do to advance a feminist agenda. By bringing we and care experts together from around the world, we have advocating that a feminist, what a feminist uh, approach should uh, include. Uh, that includes support for domestic and care workers, rights um, of organizing, uh, engaging youth, um, state investment, and also intersectional approaches. Oxfam has a lot of care programs. I'm going to focus on uh, two of them. Oh, one of them here is um, uh, we have Oxfam um, uh, Unpaid Care. We call, uh, the program is known as We Care. It was launched in 2014 in five countries within wider Oxfam programs. Now it is being implemented in 23 countries. Um, the program um, aims to make unequal care work more visible as a key barrier to achieving uh, gender equality and overcoming poverty. Uh, we also work with the communities, governments, development practitioners, and uh, the private sector work together um, to reduce and redistribute care work. Um, if, you, if you have any more questions regarding the programming, please feel free to um, let me know. I would be happy to help. Um, I'm a program person, um, uh, and uh, uh, that is where my expertise lies. Um, in, uh, in care programming, we focus on uh, four R's, um, uh, with social norm change and ensure that care work is recognized by both women and men, their families, communities, government, and wider society. With proper infrastructural and support service, reduce uh, the difficult and inefficient tasks, redistribute care work more equitably between women and men, and redistribute costs from poor families to states and employers and ensuring effective representation of cares and their needs and rights to decision making. The other program that we have is based in Bangladesh uh, that is called Securing Rights for Women Domestic Workers um, in Bangladesh with the ultimate outcome being to increase their well-being of the domestic workers. Uh, we, 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 we expect to reach 15,000 women domestic workers based in Dhaka. Um, we work in both the end of strengthening the agency of women domestic worker and also to the policy end. Why is that? More than 10.5 million people are employed as domestic workers in Bangladesh, out of which approximately 90% are women. 17% of total labor force over the age of 15, and they have no legal labor protection. Despite being a significant Signatory, Bangladesh government has not yet ratified ILO Convention C-189 on domestic worker. The Labor Law Act does not recognize the domestic worker as any labor for, formal labor force. And as I mentioned, there are 10.5 million workers currently working uh, as domestic worker in Bangladesh. As, as, as mentioned, why domestic work? Domestic work is not only important in Bangladesh itself, but also globally it has estimated that 67 million domestic workers worldwide are mostly consists of women, and only one in those 10 domestic workers have equal protection when it comes to law. Um, they have no minimum wage, no legal, legal protection, and no security uh, when it comes to society. They have no social, social security whatsoever. When we look at the uh, economy itself, um, the conditions under which both paid and unpaid care work are performed influence each other and also have a bearing on paid care work outside the care economy. The unequal and often, often large amount of unpaid care work carried out mainly by women and girls constrains their av availability to undertake paid employment and the type of quality of jobs they can access. This disproportionate burden and lack of adequate care option impacts the number of hours spent in paid work, resulting in a, what, what, what ILO has defined as motherhood employment penalty. 
don't get me wrong, providing care work can be rewarding experience and the majority of women and men, both unpaid care carriers and care workers, consider it a privilege to spend time and experience this emotional journey. However, the fact that a significant portion of care work in all societies involves routine housework and open drudgery is unequally distributed between women and men, which, carry, which renders an invisible and, and a substantial cost. This undervaluation of unpaid care work then leads to lower wages and worsening working conditions in the care sectors in which women are largely overrepresented. This unpaid care work, paid care, and Paid care work connects and comes in full circle all the time. In, in terms of domestic workers in COVID-19, the condition of a part-time domestic workers uh, in Bangladesh, for an example, they do not, it doesn't allow them to have social distancing because the, the condition that they live in has common washroom, common communal kitchen, and um, this, is, this is a very common denominator in, in urban slums. And, and the employers have decided to remove their support and not pay them their rightful salaries for at least for the last couple of months and push them into the streets to beg and stripping them of whatever dignity that they have left. Um, and when it comes to in, in, live in domestic workers, in times of no pandemic, it is extremely difficult to reach out. And in today's COVID uh, climate, it makes the task nearly impossible. Um, the abuse and violence uh, will continue to happen because behind those closed doors, no one is going to hear um, any living domestic workers. And uh, we have conducted a rapid need assessment with our uh, local partner for securing rights, which has uh, which has shown that 95% of domestic domestic workers are now out of employment and have no source of income. 90% of those domestic workers are experiencing abuse in their own home because they are not bringing no they, they don't have an advantage and they are not bringing any home any money. And 95%. 95% of those domestic workers have not received any salaries, as I mentioned, for the last four to five months. Um, uh, in securing rights, we have we have conducted some immediate responses, uh, like supporting do domestic workers for with food, hygiene, keys, and awareness campaigns. These awareness campaigns are largely targeted towards the employers because, as you can see. Um, as you can understand, the domestic workers do not have access to information either when it comes to even through social media or in right now any door-to-door -door campaigning is not even possible. So the target of the project has been to target the employers to raise awareness among the employers so that they can pass along the information to their domestic workers rightfully um, and um, as informatively as possible. Um, as we understand what is needed for our for securing um, for, for these domestic workers for a recovery is that we need to ensure that the domestic workers health safety and labor rights are protected and also they are aware about their rights because they are they they belong to an, in a part of a marginalized society that they don't even trust themselves of having any sort of rights or that they deserve any sort of security or safety when it comes to housing health or social benefits and how we are trying to do it. We are currently in talk with one of the largest NGOs in, in the world, BRAC, um, and we, uh, we want to partner with their advocacy, um, advocacy unit and with, with strengthening the capacity of the uh, WROs and the domestic worker groups. So we want to advocate uh, with the government of Bangladesh for securing social and legal rights of domestic workers. We want to see tangible changes in the Labor Act of, um, of Bangladesh, recognizing this sector as a formal labor force. We are also conducting a research on uh, digital citizenship, um, uh, collaborating with Monash University in Australia uh, to understand that how technology and, and uh, different strategies and techniques can be considered um, in this kind of situation, considering the culture, language, social economic factors of domestic workers. Um, it is important that we, we, we move, for, move from a, a higher literacy and people who have access of technology such as phone and internet to, uh, to, uh, tar to target um, uh, the marginalized people who, who do not probably have the proper access of education or, or or, or technological needs and how we can uh, build on that digital citizenship among them. 
um, that is one of the uh, uh, strategies that this project is taking. In, in my last words, that I hope that this uh, pandemic brings out a much needed look at the situation for domestic workers, Bangladesh or globally, uh, and globally, and results in changes in the current policies for domestic workers. I hope this pandemic shines a light on the critical role of care work, which has always been a central but yet undervalued contributor in the mainstream economy. How we respond to COVID-19 can be an opportunity to invest in care and standalone care programming, one of the most transformative but neglected areas of we agenda as well. To lift ourselves out of, out of the economic crisis that is looming in the future, the care economy will be one of the most important ones uh, for that recovery is, is that what I believe. Um, thank you so much. Um, uh, this is the end of my presentation, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Pauline. And uh, yes, I uh, forgot to mention earlier, those of you in the audience, there is a small uh, Q&A um, icon at the bottom uh, right of your screen, most likely, and feel free to use that during the, uh, during the presentation. Um, so thank you again, uh, Pauline. Now I'll, I'll turn um, the floor to uh, Sabrina Habib, our third panelist. Now, Sabrina Habib is the co-founder and chief exploration officer at Kidogo, a social enterprise that improves access to high quality, affordable childcare in Kenya's low income communities. Prior to Kidogo, Sabrina spent three years working with the Aga Khan Development Network in East Africa, managing an integrated primary healthcare project and a large portfolio of social innovations related to maternal and child uh, health. Sabrina holds a master's of public administration and development practice from Columbia University, an executive education certificate in leading and scaling early childhood initiatives from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. And she was also named as Canada's top female social entrepreneur by Elle magazine uh, just a few years ago, 2016. But these days it feels, uh, uh, 2016 feels like a long way off. But uh, uh, anyways, um, and that is just the, the start of a number of many accolades that, uh, that you've received. So uh, with that, please uh, join me in welcoming Sabrina to, uh, to the panel. Sabrina, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for having me on this webinar and, and for bringing light to a, a very important uh, topic. So as we know, women and girls um, carry a disproportionate amount of the unpaid care burden, and this was all pre-COVID. During COVID, the situation has become a lot worse. And Patricia and, and Shami Minaz, um did a great job of, of showing the case for this, um, the data, the statistics. I, I don't think there's a need for me to repeat any of that. And instead, I, I'd like to actually just, just share a few stories of what we're seeing on, on the ground. <laughs> so as a bit of background, uh, Kidogo is the leading childcare network in Kenya. Uh, we use a social franchising approach to help women in the community, who we call our mamapreneurs, to start or grow their own uh, childcare micro businesses. Um, we have 139 centers in our network, serving nearly 3,000 children, zero to five years, across 12 informal settlements or urban slums, uh, mainly in Nairobi and its environs. And we're on a path to doubling this reach um, when, when COVID hit. So our first COVID case was confirmed nearly three months ago, it was March 13th, and the government took uh, swift action and closed all schools three days later. And what's interesting in Kenya and, and many other countries in the global south, there are no regulations around childcare. They aren't considered schools, um, they aren't governed by any ministry. We often talk about it as this hot potato where you know, Ministry of Education looks at children from pre-primary, so age four onwards, and just the education aspect. Ministry of Health focuses on children in the younger years, but really only their immunization and nutrition. Uh, Ministry of Gender uh, focuses on orphans and vulnerable children. And so that crucial period of the zero to three, and particularly childcare, um, really falls in between. And as a result, when schools were closed, um, there was a lot of confusion of whether childcare centers were also supposed to be closed. And it really depended on the chief of that community on how he interpreted um, the rules of whether or not childcare centers were considered learning institutions or places of gathering. But across the board, uh, since schools were closed and older siblings were at home to look after younger siblings, uh, parents opted to pull out their children from childcare. And so most childcare centers closed as a result of the lack of business. 
One example of that is Mary. So meet Mary. Uh, she started a childcare center in an informal settlement called Baba Dogo, um, called Little Stars. Um, it was a thriving childcare center. It had 23 children. She charged $5 a month. And when COVID hit, all of her children were now at home and uh, she had to close down the center. She just wasn't getting any business. And unfortunately, her husband lost his job at the same time. And now uh, Mary uh, goes to the side of the road every day and tries to sell fish, um, as sardines, to try and earn something so that she can put food on the table. She keeps telling us that she wants things to go back to normal. Um, and, and often, you know, reflecting on, on what I'm hearing, you know, normal wasn't that good for, for women in many cases. And so I often think about, is there a way that we can go back to, you know, something better? What we're seeing uh, is that 40% of our childcare centers in our network have reopened in the past three months because it's their only source of income. They need money, but they're operating with just a handful of kids, you know, 10 to 15% capacity. And most of the kids are not even paying fully. You know, a mother will drop off a child, will say that she's gonna try and earn some money. If she's able to make money, she'll pay. If she doesn't earn money that day, she will, you know, drop the child off the next day and, and keep accruing a debt. And so mom operators or childcare operators are really struggling right now. They're unable to cover their rent. Um, they're, they're, they may not be able to keep their premise. And I think what's really concerning about this is that at the earliest, what we know right now is that schools may open September 1st. So two and a half more months of this, we worry about the collapse of the childcare market. There won't be enough supply when the time comes. Um, at Kidogo, we're offering cash transfers to our uh, mamapreneurs, our childcare operators in our network to help them keep afloat. We're providing water and soap. There's a water shortage, unfortunately, in the informal settlements right now. So making sure that there's good hand washing and hygiene, we're supporting in that way. But you know, we represent 139 centers out of a projected 3,500 centers uh, across Nairobi's informal settlements right now. So just a, a drop in the bucket. The situation is equally tough for women and for mothers. 80% um, of Kenya's population are daily laborers. And as we heard from Patricia and, and Shaminaz, um, the, the daily laborers tend to be women. Three months of unemployment is a death sentence. I want you to meet uh, Mama Mercy. Mama Mercy um, lives in Kibera. Uh, she's a grandmother. She's in her early 40s. Um, she has one child who's 23 years old, but is disabled, so is unable to work. And uh, she's a, a grandmother to Musembi, a five-year-old child who comes to uh, one of our Kidogo centers. She is the only breadwinner of the family. She used to work in the industrial area of Nairobi and earned something like $2 a day. Uh, but given the curfews and the restrictions and just the lack of money in the economy right now, she doesn't have any more work. And so she relies on well-wishers um, to, to help her get by. Um, she and like many other families we've been speaking to are down to one meal a day. This is really what we're hearing across the board. Though there are social distancing measures in place, people need to work. And so there's still this vibrant hustle in the informal settlements right now, in spite of cases increasing every single day. The common sentiment that we're hearing, unfortunately, is I'd rather get corona than die of hunger. And this brunt of bringing in money every day on top of the child rearing and the cooking and the cleaning is falling on women. There's such, such high levels of stress right now. So the question is, if women are hustling every day and trying to work, um, who's looking after the young kids when the mothers are, are going to work? And it's adolescent girls like Faith. Um, when I look at this picture, I, it brings back so many memories. So we met, I met Faith um, in January, 2015, uh, at our opening of our second Kidoko Center in a, a place called Kangemi, an informal settlement in, in, in Nairobi. And uh, we had a community opening day and um, the, uh, her mom was, was not able to come. She was working that day and so sent Faith with her baby brother Martin on uh, her back to go check out what this whole opening was all about. I remember Faith because she had these wide eyes and this beautiful smile. And um, I remember hearing that she struggled a lot 
uh, to go to school. She was going to school, but she missed a lot of days because she had to constantly look after Martin when her mom um, had, to, had to work. And fast forward five years, um, nearly five years, I met Faith again uh, in October last year at the Kidogo graduation where her brother Martin was graduating from our Kidogo Center and now going on to class one at, at a local primary school. I recognized Faith right away, her wide eyes, her beautiful smile, and uh, talked to her about what the last few years have been like for her. And she mentioned that she now goes to school regularly. She doesn't miss a school as much because Martin is in a great place. Um, and she's doing really well in school and she has dreams of becoming a teacher. And I remember coming home uh, from, from work that day thinking like, this is exactly why we started Kidogo. It's all about having a safe place for children to get the best start to life, ensuring their mothers have peace of mind and are able to go to work, and uh, to ensure that older girls don't have to carry this brunt of uh, childcare responsibilities. Uh, I was curious about what was happening to Faith during this COVID period. And so we actually called her this week uh, to see what was going on and found out that uh, she, like many other uh, kids in Kenya, are receiving homework through WhatsApp right now. Um, but unlike her male counterparts, she is having trouble doing her homework because she looks after Martin and her baby brother, Eric, um, every day while her mom goes to, to find work to do. Her mom washes clothes door to door and earns something like $2.50 or $3 a day. And so Faith uh, waits until the evening time when her brothers are in bed for her to be able to do her homework. And I think that this is so unfortunate because it exposes this stark reality that girls face this childcare burden, particularly during this COVID period and during the holiday months that we have um, in Kenya. And they're often pulled out of school or not able to do their homework or not able to just be kids themselves because they have this burden that uh, a boy sibling wouldn't have. And here's our time to, to, to really, really think about this and, and look at this injustice and this inequality and figure out what we want to do about it as a community. I, I get teary-eyed when I think about Faith and uh, Mary and, and Mama Mercy um, because they are three people, but they represent thousands of people in Kenya and hundreds of thousands of people around the world. Um, but as an entrepreneur, instead of seeing these as problems, I see it as an opportunity. What if we use this as an opportunity to reimagine the childcare sector? You know, when curfews end, when some of these restrictions lift um, and the economy begins to open up, there's going to be a need to get people back to work. And people means women as well. And we know that childcare is the best way to ensure that women are able to look for work and keep a job because they don't need to stress about what's happening with their child during, during those working hours. Childcare is an absolutely essential precursor to women's economic empowerment and to girls' education, and we need to treat it as such. Um, there was a, a study that Patricia, um, who we heard earlier, APHRC and GROW were involved in a couple years ago that showed that in a slum in Nairobi called Korogocho, uh, we were able to close the gender employment gap in less than a year through free, free childcare. So women and men were able to work at the same levels um, because childcare was offered. And so there, there's... It's not rocket science here. I think we've got something that we know that works. I think it's time now to, to think about how we use this post-COVID recovery period as an opportunity to widen the, the child care reach and enable women to go to work and, and uh, young girls to be able to stay in school. It's something that we're exploring as part of Kidogo, where we're thinking about a partnership with the county governments, with academia, to launch a public-private partnership as part of the recovery that would provide subsidized childcare to low-income women. And in my mind, it's a it's a win-win. It's actually a win-win-win-win. You know, children get the best start to life. Women work with peace of mind. Girls are able to return to school. The economy benefits. It just makes total sense. And so I, I hope um, with that, we can kind of start the conversation around how we might not just go back to normal, but really build back better. Thanks so much. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Sabrina, for giving us uh, uh, a picture, um, very human picture coming from, uh, from the ground in, in Nairobi. 
Um, our fourth panelist is Margaret Namirembe Kakande, uh, who's the head of the Budget Monitoring and Accountability Unit at the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development in Uganda. Her responsibilities include many things, including coordinating the gender and equity budgeting programs at the ministry, as well as spearheading the uh, gender and equity budgeting initiative in government for which a national Golden Jubilee Award was given in March of 2018. Margaret holds a master's in development economics from the University of East Anglia, a bachelor of statistics at, from Makerere University, and a postgraduate diploma in feminist development economics uh, from the Institute of Social Studies in the Netherlands, as well as a large number of certificates. So, Margaret, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for inviting me to this meeting. First of all, I want to apologize that uh, I don't have a presentation, but I'm just going to share with you our experience as we, we see it on the ground. So I want to first, first of all thank my fellow panelists for their presentations because they've made my work easy. I'm going to build on to what they've said, Sabrina and Patricia. We have the same experiences in terms of women being overworked because of the, 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 the caregivers. So with the COVID, of course, it has been worsened in terms of them being able, being actually taking on the, the most of the work in, in, the, in the homes. So what do we see in, in, the, in the homes? We've, we had our first case of COVID in March, and like Kenya, we had the schools closed a week later, but we also had a lockdown whereby people are supposed to stay at home and not to report just as the government was saying, we had to contain the spread of the virus. So what do we see? You have this increased number of people at home, but the women are still doing all the work. So, and that is actually hurting because you have all these people in the households, still looking at the woman who is supposed to do all the care work. You have to prepare the food, you have to do the cleaning, you have to do the, the child care and so on. And, to me, as somebody who is actually advocating for redistribution of, of child of um, care work, the question is, you have all these males, I'm not going to say the husbands, there are so many males, it could be the husbands or the, the sons and others in the house, who are just sitting around and they're not working because they don't see that work as their work. So, and I think the challenge now to all of us is, how do we step up now creating awareness on this issue of redistributing care work. Which aspects of care work are men willing to take up? And this is something we have to work on as soon as possible because in most of our countries, this COVID is not going to go away today. It may take a number of months and a number of people have partial lockdown. So the question is, what are they willing to take on in terms of assisting the, the women? So I'm just going to share with you some of the examples in the number of aspects that women are actually undertaking. The first one is the issue of food provision. It is the responsibility of women in, in a number of our communities to actually put food on the table in terms of them being able to prepare the food. So what happened with the COVID? Most of their spouses actually lost livelihoods. So they just sit home, they're not earning. Those who had small businesses, they've actually used up all the capital. And now what is happening is that you, people are reducing consumption in the, house, in the household, but women are still expected to actually provide food. So what do we see? We have a spiral of gender-based violence. In the last three months alone, we've had more than 5,000 cases of gender-based violence reported. And sadly, out of these, some of them have actually even started into death. So this is a critical issue. And one thing we, we, we see in terms of uh, this gender-based violence, it's mainly in the um, urban or semi-urban areas because for the rural areas, their life is almost as was before, before the COVID. But people who are in the urban areas who are actually under the lockdown, who are having the informal activities, livelihoods have been shattered, they have nothing to do, but they still have to continue with their lives. You see a lot of stress, people are stressed, there's a lot of gender-based violence in the homes, and women still have to, 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 to provide food. So one of the things that I, I would propose is, um, I think we, we are looking at uh, a, a time when we should actually be training most of our women, the caregivers, in, in, especially in the urban areas, on how to take on what we call 
urban farming, having kitchen gardens, how you can actually produce some of the foodstuffs at home without even having land. There are so many ways of producing, of producing food without having large, large, large parcels of land. And I think we should quickly invest in this kind of training for most of these caregivers in the urban areas, for them to be able to produce food. It's like that, even if this cold COVID went on for some time and we still have partial lockdowns, they should be able to have something to complement their food supplies within the household. Now, on the side of childcare and education, like Sabrina was saying, for us, what happened when the schools were closed, government declared that now we are going to go into digital learning, but also having distant learning. And what the government has done, the, we have a number of training programs which are on TV, which are on radio, but government has also produced a lot of training materials and sent them out to the communities. And now what has happened, the parents are supposed to take on the role of teachers. Now, this is a challenge because you find that child care is a, a, a function which is left to women. But having said that, we still have a lot of these women who are illiterate. So that, that is the big challenge. Now what happens? You're supposed now to take up the role of teaching because they're sending you materials and you're supposed to support your kids. So you're supposed to teach them because they, it's assumed that you, you can do it since they are sending you the, 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 the instructional materials. It, it's a big challenge. And I think now this is a reawakening the whole debate of uh, functional adult literacy. I think we have to re really get serious on this, ensuring that most of these women actually get some training, they get some functional adult literacy training, whether COVID is on or not. Now we actually it has shown us that we are we somehow had um, slackened in terms of ensuring that everybody is literate. But now here we are being forced to expect that the parents, especially the mothers, to become the teachers of the parents. But how can they do that when actually they are, they are illiterate? And of course, related to that is the whole notion, of, like Sabrina has said, you know, it was Polina who talked about this uh, notion of uh, digitization. The, the COVID has actually forced us to become the IT, all of us to, to resort to using ICT gadgets and whatever. And now you have all these people who are in their homes who don't have the, the, the IT equipment, who, are, who don't have the, 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 the IT literacy. And that, that means that they, you're actually excluding a whole population out there. Uh, so which means that we have also to, to actually look at this whole issue of ICT. And I think uh, the, the example that was shared for Bangladesh, which is happening in terms of having a research and having digital citizenship has to be something which should actually quickly be done and for, for all of us to see how we can actually roll it out to most of our communities because I think that is the way to go whether we 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 we, we, we stop COVID or not we may actually not go might not go back to how life was so this whole issue of uh, digital digital use has to actually be looked at very seriously in terms of how do we help people who are in the care economy to actually also get literacy in terms of um, ICT. In terms of health, I know that uh, it's mainly the women who are the health caregivers. Thank goodness that for us right now, we, yes, our cases are many. We, have almost, we are almost hitting 700 cases in the country, uh, but majority of these people actually not, are from the neighboring countries and most of them have gone back to their countries. So those who are remaining are all, as soon as you are, you are seen to have the virus, they are all taken to hospitals. So they're not actually like the Kenya where you, you have these people under home care, not yet, although we might go there if the numbers spiral up and, and the health units cannot actually handle the, the cases. So they are still in the health units. Now, uh, for us, the only problem is with the lockdown, you find that people had other ailments, other non-communicable diseases. We have women who are expecting who have to, 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 to access healthcare services, but with a lockdown, we have issues of access. So you find that most people now cannot access healthcare services, not for COVID, but for other ailments. And this means that the women now who are at home who are giving care are again burdened for further to look after people who have all these other, either non-communicable diseases or some, some which are communicable. But the, the issue is the, the, the skilling that they need in terms of being able to do this, this work properly, which may actually be lacking, and that is a challenge. 
So for, for us, the, the way I see this um, COVID and care work, life has become worse, definitely, for most of the, the, the caregivers. But one of the, the, the policy things that I think we should actually focus on is how we ensure that these people who are under the um, care work go digital, because I think this is the way to go. But also I, I see some two research areas which I think we should quickly look into. This issue of uh, redistributing care work, yes, we all believe in it and it has to happen. But we have to find out those aspects of redistribution of gender roles that are palatable to men. Because we all agree that most of the policymakers in our countries are men. And if we talk about redistribution of uh, gender roles, the men have to buy into it. And if you're talking about enhancing awareness in terms of redistributing of, um, of, of, of roles, again, it has to be the, 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 the key policymakers to buy into it. So what are, what are those aspects that they will actually buy into in terms of us pushing our agenda of redistribution of gender roles? This is some bit of work that we have to do in terms of research. Another piece of research which I think we should actually work on very fast is on the social protection. I think the loss of uh, livelihoods for most of the, the, the spouses for the caregivers has actually shown that the care work, people who are doing care work actually need some form of social protection. So the question is, what, is, what can work for, for the developing countries? What kind of mechanisms can be put in place to ensure that even if you're a caregiver at home, in this kind of times when we have a crisis, when you have a pandemic, you have a fallback position. So we need to look at aspects in terms of uh, social protection, what can work. We have to look at issues of affordability, what can these countries actually afford in terms of getting people who are not actually formally employed into the, into the net social protection. We have to look at issues of scope, what kind of aspects should actually be covered. Uh, if you look at, for example, the, some of the examples right now, we were talking, if you talk about water, COVID has called the, the whole notion of water. If you, you tell somebody, wash your hands every 20 minutes, the first question would be, what is the water? So in this case, and if you look at um, most of the people who are, who are in the urban areas, this is where you, you have to look at water, which is being paid for, because you have to look at uh, a utility bill. So in this case, if you're looking at issues of social protection, what aspects can we actually talk about in terms of ensuring that people who are in the care work can actually be supported, for example? to meet some of these uh, needs, the water needs, in terms of subsidizing some of these utilities. So I think we have to look at this issue of uh, social protection, what can actually be meaningfully done, what can be, what, what is affordable for some of the, of the countries for us to move the, the COVID agenda forward. So basically, for me, I'm, I'm looking at um, issues of policy for some of our countries in terms of pushing kitchen urban farming for, for most of these people, because yeah, at least in our case, the COVID has had a, a, a more negative impact on urban dwellers. So the issue of uh, urban farming, the issue of adult functional literacy being actually stepped up again, basically for women who are now having to take up some of these functions of, of uh, training or instructing the, their children. The issue of ICT, how do we make sure that actually women can access ICT and also have the relevant literacy in those areas. And of course, lastly, the two areas I've mentioned of research, aspects of redistribution that policymakers can easily buy into, and also the issue of social protection. I want to thank you. Great, thank you very much, Margaret. Um, so uh, we will turn our attention now to um, to the roundtable. Um, there have been a, a, an amazing number of uh, research ideas and, and policy uh, issues come up through the four uh, panelists. Um, I have some notes, but I'd, I'd like to maybe just turn now. Um, I'll let Leva now take uh, take control of the the roundtable. And uh, so again, we've been tasking our panelists to identify research priorities and, um, and these policy solutions. And uh, so the idea is to dive into those a little bit more in the next 15, 20 minutes. And then after that, we'll open it up to the question and answer. And again, um, seeing that the Q&A tab is, uh, is starting to be active with some, uh, with some very good questions. So Leva, I'll leave it to you now. Thank you so much, Sonia. And thank you so much to all our panelists for raising many interesting and important issues as it relates to the care economy um, and the impact of COVID-19. 
So to begin the moderated round table, I will start actually by asking each of you, um, you'll have approximately five minutes to um, discuss what are the current, given the current context, what should be really, you know, identifying one or two key research priorities or some policy solutions, possible policy implications and solutions um, that we should be reflecting on more as we move forward. So we'll go in the same order, um, starting with, with Patricia. Thank you, Leva. Um, I think as, as uh, my fellow presenters have uh, mentioned, one of the issues that we need to think about in terms of uh, research with regards to COVID-19 is what, just thinking about what social protection measures are in place and how these can be improved, particularly for those women who are in informal settlement settings where these uh, measures may not be very uh, um, accessible to them. The other thing that, um, we could think about, we know that um, this issue, the COVID-19 uh, situation is very stressful and uh, probably mothers who were the main um, breadwinners for their families are feeling mentally oppressed or their mental health status, their mental health well-being is not very good right now. This in turn has an impact on the caregiving um, that they can provide for their children. So we are likely to see in the future post COVID, we are likely to see impact on both mothers and their children. So we need to think about what aspect of uh, mental health support these mothers can be given post COVID or even now during the COVID period. And then we also need to look at their children, the young children, particularly those under the age of five years who are mostly under the care of their primary caregivers who are likely to be mothers. We need to look at how the COVID situation has impacted different outcomes among these children. Um, another area that uh, maybe we need to think about, we know that uh, many of these women or many families have left the city. How are we going to reintegrate them back into their, not old life because we're moving into a new normal, but back into the city and the way that they were used to getting an income and living their lives without, um, really disturbing or really having a negative impact on the way that their lives are moving on. So we need to think about a reintegration policy. And this has to do also with having social protection measures in place so that when they return to the city, they are able to get back into the jobs that they had or similar jobs, similar to what they had earlier. They are able to even get back to their um, household setups because it is likely that many of the families that have left their homes, they're likely to lose these homes. Um, Sabrina mentioned that some of them are not able to pay rent. And it's likely that when they return, the situation may be the same. So we need to think about um, how to reintegrate them back to society so that they can continue with their lives in a meaningful way. Thank you. Colin? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Patricia. I would like to echo your words. A response and recovery plans must not reinforce gender inequalities, as we have seen in numerous reports how global economy relies on women's unpaid care and domestic work. And as we all have seen, it is rising exponentially during this COVID-19 pandemic. And I, I believe that response and recovery packages must provide women with income support and uh, special measures to protect them uh, from gender-based violence and, um, and and, and, and to recover from these uh, inequalities. Uh, I like what Margaret said, uh, that we cannot uh, go back uh, the, the way things were. It needs to be better. Um, also, we have, must resist the ideology of severity, shift money from militarized solutions, and invest urgently in the public sector and its workers, uh, especially when it comes to doctors, nurses, teachers, and care workers. Um, uh, in order to do so, we can we can take actions on debt, uh, austerity, and tax. Uh, tax could deliver system change for all public services. There are ways to do it um, because quality provision of early childcare, public education, health, and water are crucial. Um, uh, alongside investments in energy, agriculture, and and and, and social protection, um, and support these systems in the global south would help us um, recover uh, from COVID-19. Is what I believe. So. Um, so there is that. Um, 
these these are the things we should should prioritize. Thank you. Yeah, those are those are great points. I think from my perspective, again, we are a child care provider, so I know that uh, field the best. And I, I think that there are two kind of research or policy angles that come to mind um, with, the, with this conversation. The first is uh, subsidized child care. Um, child care is a public good, right? It, it is something that governments should be able to do. And here is an opportunity for us to try it out. And I, I completely understand that governments are, are, are tight with budgets. Margaret, I, I'm sure you're, you're nodding along because I can only imagine that you know, government budgets are stretched in every way possible and childcare might not be a priority right now. So let's get some donor dollars in there. Let's show how it can work. Let's research it. Let's do a pilot project um, at some significant scale and show that childcare and a subsidized childcare model will work in so many different ways and create that proof point that governments might be able to buy into. And so I'm, I'm a big proponent of, let's start to, to recognize um, childcare as something that needs to be part of the policy conversations. Because unfortunately, the vast majority of policymakers that we speak to believe that children under the age of four should be in the care of their parents during the working day. And the, the reality is that parents are, are simply working and, and children need to be somewhere. I, I think that the second part is um, around um, employer supported childcare. So there's a, a lot of stuff going on right now, um, spearheaded by IFC um, called Tackling Childcare, which is around how can employers support childcare because we know the benefits of childcare um, to female employees. It reduces absenteeism, they're not looking after their sick child, uh, increases productivity, reduces stress, increases retention. There's really, really good, strong, solid research from that. Um, the truth, though, is that, as we mentioned, you know, 80% of Kenya's population are informal laborers. They don't have a, a steady employee. And so I think there are some really cool research opportunities here to look at child care for the informal labor, which is where the majority of women fall into. And again, show some really evidence-based research that uh, child care can help boost women's economic empowerment. Um, so those are, those are two areas that I, I think would be interesting to look into. So th thank you, Sonia, for, for, for that question. I think I actually did allude to some of the research areas which are, I thought were important. And I agree with what Patricia has said. I think the issue of mental health is going to be critical in terms of looking at how you can actually support mothers and the, and the kids because there's a lot of stress, you know, with this pre-COVID. I, I agree with the reintegration of women. But I want to go back to Pauline's research, which she did mention in her presentation. The, the issue of digital citizenship, I think we have to take this seriously in terms of how do we ensure that our women, and in some of our cases, the women who are illiterate, are integrated into the digital world. It's, it's going to be a challenge, but it's something that we have to take up with, uh, take, it, uh, take the, 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 the challenge units with our, with our two hands, because the way we, we are going, we have to ensure that if you're talking about leaving no one behind, this is something which is a challenge that has been thrown on the policy table. How do you ensure that the way of the new way of doing things does not be, become the challenge in terms of you using that as a way of excluding people? And in this case, you're looking at most of the, the majority of our people, the, the people who are in the care work, the, the care work who are unpaid, but they're doing a hell lot of work for all of us supporting our well-being, but they have to, to participate in the developing process. So this is going to be a challenge in terms of how do we do it? How do we integrate these people in terms of ensuring that actually they can pick up skills of um, IT, how they can actually become IT literate, literate at, the, at their level and be able to use that meaningfully in terms of uh, doing their work. And I, I want to also go back to the issue of, um, of social protection, I think we have to really look at that, what, what will work for, 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 for these people, because it's a critical thing. I don't think we are going to have a breakthrough very soon in terms of people having their livelihoods back, getting people on their feet. So we have to also look at uh, some aspects of, um, because there are different ways of looking at social protection. We can look at uh, us looking at issues of um, people who are going to, to, do, to do work for, 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 for money. So in this case, we, we, we can as well begin asking the, the critical questions. What kind of reskilling 
can some of these people actually be given or new skills? What new skills can we bring on board for some of these women to for them to be able to to work in the new we, are, we still have COVID, in the new COVID and, and post-COVID era. So we have to critically look at the question in terms of what kind of, of, of skilling can we meaningfully talk about for some of these women, for them to be able to continue to do, to, to do their work without actually being overworked, but be able to live a meaningful life and uh, have um, good welfare for, 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 for their, their families without, without all the stress, because we're, we're talking about mental health and so on. So it's going to be a it's, it's going to be a difficult thing, but something which, which actually we, we should actually begin interrogating now. What can we actually introduce? What can we uh, propose in terms of people being able to to take up in terms of productive work in in their different sphere in their different spheres of life? So I think that is also a critical area that we have to 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 take on. <coughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. So I do think um, some really key themes have come out. You know, how do our social protection policies really reach these informal workers or reach people living in settlements, especially when we're seeing a rise in um, reverse migration with urban dwellers going to uh, rural areas? And how do we, you know, address our assumptions that if kids at, are at home, parents can teach them when, you know, we have a vast population of, of um, adult illiteracy. Um, illiteracy. And um, a lot of the questions that we're getting right now, are some really great questions. So I'll move right into the, the Q&A um, portion. And um, a lot of the questions are feeding into these research priorities and policy um, implications. So I'll start with the first one, uh, first question. And that is, are there any programs or incentives in place to promote digital literacy for women in Kenya? Um, this, uh, the comment is that this seems to be something that must be accelerating now, especially as we're looking at these liter um, illiteracy issues. So are there any programs or incentives in place? Um, and then there was also another question. Um, what are feasible childcare options that are also safe and possibly um, were able to do socially socially distance for COVID. I know one question that was answered, and I'll put that out there for the first round, and then um, I know Sabrina already answered it, but maybe we can present it to the, the group. Um, the question for Sabrina was on the public-private partnership to scale up Kidogo with the country governments in Kenya. You know, your current model puts women at the center in terms of running the childcare business, which means that women are having a win-win. They run the business and other women have options for childcare. What are the plans to ensure that the scaled model continues to use the same model? Could there be risk of big businesses taking this over? So I'll, I'll start with those questions and then we'll we'll come in and answer um, other ones. So I'll leave the floor open. And maybe, uh, maybe I can kick us off. Um... So a, a couple of, of points there. So on on the last question around childcare and how do you how do you ensure big businesses don't take that over? Um, I think it's a really solid question. Um, the the truth is that uh, quality childcare for low income populations is not particularly profitable. <laughs> Our childcare centers, each individual one, is profitable, and uh, uh, the woman running it, the mamapreneur, is able to make a decent living, but if it is a big business that's trying to make a quick buck, childcare is probably not the place that they want to be investing in because it's not particularly profitable when you're trying to do it at quality, at a high level of quality, and um, when you're dealing with such low income populations where you're charging you know, 50 or 60 cents per day. Um, but I, I, I completely understand the point and, and the, the research shows that you know, it's the small scale community owned Childcare centers that are best for child development, as opposed to these large, mega-scale, um, impersonal type of situation. And so, how do we continue to maintain the essence of this model, which are these like independent, incredibly empowered um, women to run their own micro business and grow it as they see fit? And I think it really comes down to uh, how do we create the right now there are no regulations, right? These childcare centers technically don't exist. They're unlicensed. There's no way to license them. There's no regulations. There's no need for training or certification or anything like that. Um, I'm, we've been pushing a lot to, to move towards these types of regulations. And I think the fear is that 
if this, the market becomes too regulated, women who we want to be owning these centers and starting these centers will have so many barriers. You know, we talked about literacy levels. Um, we talked about, you know, maybe needing to submit an application online and, and women not having access to a computer um, and things like that. So how do we reduce the barriers as much as possible, create the, the most simplest process so that it actually encourages women to start these own, their, their own centers and maintain the efficacy of, of that model? But really cool question. I'm happy to chat more about it if, if you'd like to. In terms of um, how do you maintain social distancing within childcare? I mean, this is a, a really huge question that we're grappling with right now as we figure out what are our reopening plans for when our own Kidoko centers um, open up again. It's hard to tell a, a child to um, stay six feet away. Um, you know, our centers are all about interaction and love and responsive caregiving. And so how do you, how do you balance that and also ensure that, that people stay safe? And some of the things that we're looking at, and again, if you've got ideas, we're happy to, to learn, um, but we're looking at ensuring that First, first and foremost, all centers have hand washing stations with soap, making sure that there is water um, so that there are hygiene practices for drop off um, and consistently throughout the day. Um, making sure that there's temperature checks. We already do health checks uh, in the morning, but just reinforcing that practice. Um, ensuring that you know we, we generally have a, a, an environment where parents can come in at any point. Um, we're looking at kind of having drop off just at the door. Um, and then if, if any, anyone gets sick in that period, what are some backup procedures to ensure that, that things continue to work? So really tough stuff. I think we're dealing with things that are so uncertain right now and no one's really dealt with this before. So we're learning along the way. Let me pause there and, and maybe turn it over to the other panelists. Yep. Um, maybe I can add to what you've mentioned about um, the socially distanced um, Childcare facilities. One of the things, one of the things that we are testing feasibility of, like I mentioned earlier, at APHRC is the provision of childcare at the workplace. And what we've realized is that the employers in the industries, mid, small and medium-sized industries, have to be convinced that this is um, useful or this is uh, going to have a positive impact for the women with young children who are working within their industries. We know that they already know that there's a, a benefit of women having uh, childcare services provided at the workplace, but for some of them, it, it seems like they need some sort of figures so that they can <clears throat> they can get convinced about the need to <clears throat> sorry about the need to provide these services at the workplace because for them profits is what they think about and when they think about provision of childcare services they they're thinking that this will this will um, sort of reduce the money that they are able to make one of the things that um, maybe we need to follow up with them is provision of um, a combined or a multiple industry supported childcare facility that feeds or is accessed by women working in several industries. And in this way, if there are several companies supporting one childcare facility, which would hopefully be large enough to accommodate a number of children who can be socially distanced within that facility, it would make sense to just have the industries supporting this childcare facility, it would make sense in terms of um, sustainability because they would be the ones supporting the running and overseeing the, the childcare facility. So I think that's one of the options that we need to think about. But before we can move there, we need to have conversations with the industry players and just try and convince them and let them see the benefit of, of offering these services at the workplace. Thank you. Patricia, I just wanted to commend what you said. I think, you know, we all on this line are so so bought into this conversation and know why it's important. But as you said, companies exist to make a profit and don't want anything to cut into their bottom line. And so they won't act just based on the moral goodness of you know, childcare um, for their for their employees. And so we need to be looking at incentives, tax incentives, tax breaks. Um, things that will motivate them, incentivize them to want to do this, and then um, allow different options for 
for uh, for offering childcare because you know this might be a business that's in the in the field of producing flowers or producing garments and have no idea what to do with children and so outsourcing it to a different company or providing community-based childcare and, and providing vouchers to their staff. Um, I think there's many different options to consider here. Okay, uh, just on the um, uh, digital literacy um, for women, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I can't really speak for Kenya what, what has been done, but I do agree uh, uh, with, uh, with Faith is that uh, this, this is something uh, that we also feel that needs to be accelerated in the social distancing to actually reach people with accessible information and uh, to provide good information, um, it's, it looks like that, uh, like to actually work in the I ICT sector is it would be one of them that we should be actually heavily uh, investing um, uh, on programs that would uh, in, uh, that would provide the incentives to uh, to 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 promote the literacy uh, for women and marginalized um, uh, community uh, in, in the global south. Um, uh, in Bangladesh, for an example, as I was saying, that we are actually working uh, uh, with um, with academicians to find out strategies that when it comes to digital literacy, we don't necessarily want to do uh, what has been done before, that people who are educated, people who have already have uh, some sort of access to these uh, equipments and, um, and, and the technology to some certain extent. We, we have uh, historically has been only targeting them and strengthening their capacity, which was needed at that point. But now it is high time that we also do, um, uh, we also come up with innovative strategies that uh, can be reached uh, to the uh, to, to that vulnerable group of people who might not have uh, that luxury to actually own a smartphone or or to be able to afford internet. So um, I, I I do believe that that is something that we all should be working uh, towards and the donors um, and the um, uh, and the uh, other stakeholders uh, should be giving an importance to. Thank you so much. I will um, oops, just one end it with one last um, Q and A question, and that is: Are there some additional challenges for migrant domestic workers, and are there some measures that should be taken to consider this particular population of concern? <laughs> okay, I can uh, I can okay. take a job at that one. Okay, sure. Thank you. Sorry. Go ahead, Margaret. No, 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 please. Um. So for migrant domestic workers, what is happening right now, particularly uh, maybe in the informal settlement setup, is that the local workers or native workers, the ones who are native to Kenya, are, feel that the, the migrant workers are taking away the few jobs that are available from them. And there's a lot of animosity between these two groups. And many of these migrant workers are feeling um, Cornered, they don't have um, opportunities for work anymore. They don't have uh, good feelings. The community is feeling um, um, is 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 not very receptive towards them. And I think this is a community. Thanks for bringing up the question. I think this is an an area that needs to be researched so that we can just find out what the current situation is in terms of what what numbers are we talking about and what is their situation in terms of where are they working how is their job situation right now particularly in the time of covid and what can be done to improve the situation that they're currently facing and of course in these um, research activities we would need to include those who are not the non-migrant workers the local the local domestic workers and just see their perceptions about the migrant domestic workers so that we can then pose this as a as a an issue that needs to be dealt with to the relevant with the relevant ministries thank you
Okay, so I think that uh, that was the round of uh, Q&A um, and uh, we're running out of time anyway, so I thought I would just uh, jump in here and just uh, say, say just a few concluding remarks and then I don't know if Martha will want to also perhaps uh, come in. I mean, one of the, this has been a, a tremendously informative session um, uh, for me, uh, certainly, and uh, there's a few things that kind of um, sort of come out immediately as being very salient. And the first one, of course, is the fact that um, childcare uh, provision is essentially an essential service, right? And so we need to start thinking uh, much more about how we can support that essential service. And, and part of it is, of course, in terms of caring for, for, for children, but there's also this notion that um, uh, Sabrina uh, brought up is that this is a market that looks, um, that it is susceptible to potential collapse due to changes in demand. And uh, this is a particular concern because eventually we're going to be coming out of these lockdowns and those are services that are going to be required. So I guess one of my key takeaways uh, from this particular panel is that we really do need to double down on efforts of trying to uh, provide this uh, very essential and public good um, in an environment that uh, in which we are thinking about reopening the economy. And so uh, this is, I think, one of the, the, the key points uh, that, that comes out for me from the perspective of policy. And there's also this, this notion that, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about um, the double burden of care, um, but it's actually multiple burdens, right? It's not just about caring for, for, for the children who aren't in school and in childcare uh, in environments where these are no longer available to them, but it's also about caring uh, for those that are ill from COVID, those that are ill from diseases which are no longer being uh, easily treatable uh, in, in this particular crisis. Um, and there's also the fact that now these women are also required uh, to do more in terms of food provision, do more in terms of teaching uh, their children, uh, the homeschooling part of, uh, art of the picture, as governments are bringing in virtual schooling into the, the equation. Um, and so I think there's, um, there's, uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity there that needs to be uh, uh, explored a lot more, both from the perspective of research and also from the perspective of, um, of policy. Um, I, we will be providing some, uh, uh, some summary. Uh, this is, uh, there's, I've got too many notes to summarize efficiently in the, in the remaining 30 seconds. Uh, so please do stay tuned on both the WedLab website, which you see here, and also through the uh, Grow Research Series Twitter, where we will be, of uh, course, communicating on future events and on past events. Um, and with that, um, before I, I close and, and thank our, our panelists and the audience for uh, an amazing session, I just want to uh, put in a plug for our next um, webinar. Our next webinar is going to tackle issues around how the pandemic and the uh, economic crisis is playing itself out in terms of uh, family dynamics. So we will be going into issues around marriage, intra-household issues, uh, fertility, and also sexual health and reproductive rights. So that I believe is on the 23rd of June. Is that right, Leva? Yeah, I think it's the 23rd of June. Um, and of course, we will be uh, posting some uh, registration links um, as we get closer to that time. Uh, the one after that will be on gender-based violence. Uh, certainly, this is a theme that has been cross-cutting in our conversations around gender and COVID. Um, so we will have a panel entirely dedicated to that topic. And then after that, uh, we will have one on the long-term impacts on girls' education. So we can see that these are clearly very interconnected uh, topics because they've cut through uh, both the first webinar and today's webinar. So uh, with that, um, I will um, just invite everybody to thank uh, the panelists for giving us a very, very good um, perspective of what's happening on the ground, uh, especially in East Africa, uh, when it comes to uh, the burden of, uh, of care um, and how women are managing this on the ground, uh, with a lot of food for thought uh, for those of us doing research and those of us with an interest in uh, thinking about what we can do um, to you know, build back better. So thank you very much.